Hi, I'm Will. I'm, um, I'm speaking to Steve from the Anonymous Iconoclasts ahead of their um, new album, Send In The Suits. Just sort of um, a quick sort of uh, background then, Steve. Could you give quickly sort of the original idea around the album? Yeah, the album came out yesterday. So it was it was released yesterday on uh, kind of all, all the platforms. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit different to other albums that we've done. It's our third album. The last album, AI, did quite well. We were on a nice little label. Um, and it kept, I'll come back to this later on, but a thing called Lockdown came along and a thing called COVID came along. So the label went. Uh, lots of the original venues around the area went. Um, and so... It, Lead, you know, we had that kind of situation, and then going into the into the lockdown phase, not all the songs, but a lot of the songs were written during lockdown. Um, some of them, in particular, things like uh, "Our New Norm" and "Safe at Home," in particular, uh, make particular references to how how we all dealt with um, with lockdown. Some of the other songs. Uh, one day I was sitting here, it was pouring down with rain, and um, it was a bank holiday. And that's the opening lyrics of a song called What Do You Think About That? Um, so there was stuff going on around me and also us, rather. And I'm, I've got about seven harmonicas and I've never really learned how to play them. So during lockdown, I learned how to play them. Um, and so I had all that stuff. We also did an EP with a guy, a really brilliant guy called James Alberto Dawkins uh, a few years ago. Um, it was going to be released as an EP on that label. Then obviously the, the label went. So, so we, we couldn't do it. Um, but he had a, a really interesting concept to do with what's called ambient, uh, kind of 360 sound. So we did all kinds of really weird stuff with us, and we recorded some good songs with him. We also had some songs that I recorded uh, myself, and then we went into a studio, recorded the bass and the drum parts, um, and we did some stuff there. So the point of all that is, all those songs were kind of written at slightly different times and in slightly different circumstances and recorded in different uh, uh kind of locations so therefore it's it's different to as there's messages coming in throughout the album by the way blinging off if they, if they go through um they'll be promoting it quite heavily um so like what i said about this album is it's less of an album and more a collection of songs which is a really weird thing to say because it's kind of counterintuitive but what i mean is there's songs from different moments that are compiled together in which in a way which i think makes kind of a co cohesive whole but um it's it's a bit different to other albums and it's also got 20 songs on it so it's essentially kind of a double album really uh and the point is which we'll come on to again later i imagine with selling albums with the music industry with the way things are i like i, I I'm promoting the album all weekend you know, people come i don't I come back to me saying i don't i don't have a cd player anymore you know, I, I, I loaded up all my stuff, put it into my, my computer. I don't have a CD player in my car. La, 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 la. There's a, there's a beautiful, and you, you'll get this from what I know of you. It's a beautiful, magical thing about having a physical product with somebody's music and artwork on it in your hand. Yeah. You can play. You can start, stop. You can skip. You can play if you've got if you're lucky enough to have it in your car. You can play at home. You can share with others. Going back to the old days of mixtapes and all the rest of it, you know, sharing of music. What I hate about the current time is the uh, disposability of creativity. That everything is free. Guess what? Everything isn't free. It might appear to be free, but the long term impact of that is that nothing will be free. Do you think possibly then with how the digitalization of a lot of music that has damaged the possibility for promising up and coming artists to get into the music music industry absolutely massively absolutely without any doubt and like a lot of things pertain into lockdown because that's the kind of what you could call academically the paradigm of the album i suppose it sits, it sits on we will not know the impact of lock of the lockdown we will not know the impact of of of, of the covid impact if you like as well but mostly the lockdown we will not know that impact like brexit we will not know for years but there will be a massive one and particularly on up and coming artists that i mean they're the ones you've got social media you can share it all over the all over the place fantastic that's great that's marvelous yeah but so can everyone else 
So, you know, it comes back to physicality in the old days of, I'm not saying we go back to this necessarily, but, you know, you go into a, a music shop or a record shop and there'd be adverts for musicians on the wall. You'd go out and about wandering around Cardiff, there'd be posters stuck onto, you know, lampposts and whatever. Uh, the kind of DIY ethos, I think we've lost a lot of that. I actually personally think that all this stuff is cyclical. And I think it will come back. Because at the end of the day, you you know, as an example, you're a human being. I'm a human being. We're having a conversation. That is never going to go out of fashion. Do you think possibly going back to an iconoclast and a part of the band is hiding their faces, which helps them stand out from the crowd? So do you think now that a lot of bands or artists need to find sort of little unique ways to make them stand out if they want to make it? Yes, yes, it's always good to have a, a USP. I mean, ours has been um, insanely unsuccessful. <laughs> but, you know, it was kind of just a quirk. You know, we were called Anonymous Iconoclast, so let's have a bit of fun with it and just make ourselves anonymous. You know, people come to gigs, so there they are. They look just like the Anonymous Iconoclast, you know, because they, they kind of are, you know. We used to say we were a tribute act to the Anonymous Iconoclast, but, you know, it's just a, fu just a fun thing. But, yeah, if you can find some sort of quirk something a little bit different. For example, being a left-handed guitarist and turning your guitar upside down and having the bass strings in the wrong order could be a quirk. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to sort of touch on, you mentioned the um, pandemic and it was really a troubling time for um, society as a whole, but do you think possibly, especially with the new album with songs on that, that inspired by that, do you think maybe the pandemic was a source of inspiration for musicians. Yeah, I was reading about something the other day and um, talking about uh, how it, normally uh, emotional pain is a trigger for creativity and songwriting. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of my stuff is written in the moment. Some of the songs on the album, if you knew what they were about, might surprise you. Um, some are about quite quite painful stuff, and um, going back to you know lockdown, and this is why the album's called Send in the Suits. By the way, so I might as well cover this. Um, if you look at the album on the front on the front of the album, there's a picture of the uh, of Parliament from across the Thames, taken on a dark, grim day by an excellent photographer called Chris Jones from CMJ uh, Photography. Um, and on the back is another picture taken by Chris, which is um, a picture of a graveyard with a big, with a, with a, with a big, uh, you know, uh, head, head headstone. Um, and again, it's very dark and dismal. So it's a nod towards uh, how, um, particularly in our country, in my opinion, um, the powers that be dealt with 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 what we went through. Um, and at some point, there's probably, you know, there's a book or even a film in it, because um, you could argue it was uh, shamelessly inept uh, and and caused the death of many people. You could argue that. But I certainly don't look back on the uh, time of lockdown and COVID, um, bearing in mind the government who we'd recently elected because of rather unsavory matters such as keeping Johnny Foreigner out of the country. If that's a reason to elect a government, then I'm afraid you reap what you sow. And a lot of really good people did not deserve at all. And why would anyone deserve you know, uh, the terrible pain they went through? But um, lions led by donkeys springs to mind. You think possibly then that sending the suits is the band's most visceral an impossibly important album message-wise. That's a, see, they're great questions because there's different a different perspective on it. You know, I there's twenty songs on the album. Um, I wrote seventeen of them. Uh, the bass player has his only ever track on an album, which again is really grim and dark, called "Deep Trouble," which I love, by the way. Um, and so that's all about you know, oh dear, something terrible has happened, right? It was actually written well before, but it ties in beautifully with, with, with the theme. And then there's two songs in there which are written by Keo, our amazing guitarist. Um, 
so because seven, I wrote 17 of the songs, you know, a couple, one or two, it was one or two instrumentals, but 15 songs. So they, those, Kia wrote a song years ago called Song, uh, called um, Head Like This. You know, so they, they've come from a head like this. You know, so they come from, they've come from my head. It's my perspective. I don't even know if the band share my philosophy on, you know, kind of socioeconomics and uh, politics. Uh, we don't we don't really talk about that stuff. We just get off and play in the tunes, really. So, uh, yeah, but probably from my point of view, it's probably, yeah, I, I, from my point of view, I would say as a songwriter, yeah, it probably is that. It's, um, as a songwriter myself, I just wanted to touch on um, possibly the songwriting process. There's a famous yeah. quote from the Lars lead singer, Lee Mavers, who always used to say, a melody always finds me. Do you say find that last line again, Will, sorry? So um, there's a famous quote from the Lars lead singer, Lee Mavers. He always used to say, a melody always finds me. Okay. So do you possibly think that um, when, as a musician, when you don't try and look for a song and you accidentally find one, then that's how the best songs appear and happen? Sometimes, I, I, you know, like I'm sure you do and other songwriters, sometimes a tune will, will come in, into my head. Sometimes I just literally, you know, just pick up my phone and just whistle into it or something or just you know capture use my use use my device as a kind of notebook a great way to write songs as well which goes back to what you're saying is um which you, people don't think about this but it's true we, we walk in four four when we're walking along we're walking along in four four that must be how nearly all songs are written it's quite a good idea if you've got a, a tune in your head or an idea for a song take a walk and uh, sometimes it can it can you know start thinking it through in your head and you come back and, and then you can you can commit to uh, to record it yeah but me melody 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 is is, is I, I think pretty well paramount for most people if we look at bands like the Manic Street Preachers for example they're a good example really then they're more lyrically orientated I think people love them because of the lyrics but um, if you've got a decent tune then you've got half a chance of uh, creating some interest value I think. What do you think is harder then for a songwriter to write a good melody or to write good lyrics? Wow. Well, um, from a personal perspective, I, I, I find lyric writing certainly significantly harder. Um, trying to say something a bit different, trying to uh, phrase things in a way, creating a rhythm, uh, you know, making the words sit in tandem with each other. Uh, that that thing, or some, yeah, I, I don't think, I very rarely, I very rarely written some lyrics and then come up with a tune. It's almost always the other way around. Um, wanted to touch on the album itself whilst I was listening to it. I was quite taken aback by the number of different sounds and different sort of genres that were used throughout. Was yeah, you it, mentioned some interesting ones in your uh, message to Yeah. Me. Was there any um, music in particular that you listened to at the time of writing the album that inspired it? No, not really. It's, you know, bearing in mind, we've been around for a while. Um, so I was listening to new stuff, you know, uh, a lot. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't hold with, you know, you stick with the music of your youth. But there have been a lot of things over the years that I've loved, which probably inhabit the way that I write. Um, I think picking up the harmonica was a bit different. It took me down more of a country route. It was quite a kind of right. country. I, I, I liken that stuff. to Bob. I liken that to Bob Dylan when I met when I message him. The harmonic, well, a lot of the harmonica sounds really. I sort yeah. of like to Bob Dylan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Bob. See, Bob Dylan is, is you know, um, if you're not a musician, but you love music, I've got a person in mind when I say this. So this person who is who's obsessed by music but doesn't play, and he's like um, belittles Bob Dylan as as yeah. a harmonica musician because you know because he's not a virtuoso. You know, he's not like. Uh, you know, Adler or whatever. He, he's not. He's not. A, he's not a virtuoso musician. But what I love about about, about his playing, um, I mean, it is how it's so simple 
and how it complements and it's so organic and it's kind of out of him because the great thing about a harmonica is because it, you know you blow into this thing so it's a physical thing so it's kind of to some extent shaped by you know the way you the way you kind of live and breathe as a musician really and i think dylan does that brilliantly um you know, before we actually um started the interview i was going to mention that I was quite taken aback while I listened to the album because at the moment I'd been listening to a lot of like post punk and new wave music, and they were sending the suits isn't necessarily a new wave or a post punk album. Not but, water. but in my opinion, there are obviously there are elements of that. And um, for example, I sort of I, I thought um, the vocals and the lyrics reminded me of like Marky Smith and the Fall, and there were sounds that reminded wow. me of like Talking Heads. And there was actually, I'm reading a book at the moment called Rip It Up and Start Again, which is all about the history of post-punk. So it really sort of is like a three, 360 moment. Please, please send me a link. I'd love to read that. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. It's sort of, um, I don't want to go too off topic, but it sort of, it goes from the late 70s where punk didn't really, was starting to sort of die. Mm. And then all the sort of, gothic rock bands that came from that and then it eventually turned into post-punk by the early 80s and i heard a lot of that i thought in um in sending the suits and i found it quite interesting reading one of um a little bit about the band that you did a lot of um covers of talking heads is post-punk music an inspiration for you okay so there's a lot there's a lot in that question um so Yes, the spirit of what what we what we would call post punk is certainly within I think all all of us in the band really. Um, you know, the guitarist is a bit older than the rest of us. He's got a lot of stuff that stuff in him. Mike DeBase um, was in a band who had quite a lot of airplay from John Peel years ago. He's got used to play his stuff quite a bit, so he's got kind of a bit of an attitude towards him. Less less so with with uh, Sean the drummer, but he is um, very much into um, really uh, excellent uh, eighty bands eighties bands. I mean, he he would like Talking Heads, he would like XTC, he would like he would like he loves Squeeze that that that, that kind of stuff. And then with me, the when I first the first song I remember loving when I was a kid, um, a long time ago was um, was uh, the Ramones. Uh, Sheen was a punk rocker, so I pl- I used to play that over and over again, and I, I love that in the same way as I love uh, Teenage Kicks, you know, uh, that they're kind of really really simple, repetitive, but fantastic m- melodic songs, and so that that that's within me, and I've also looked a lot into, I mean, I'm often being as a vocalist compared to, which is lovely, David Byrne, um, you know, the, the old CBGB stuff and all the rest of it. So there's a, there's a little bit of an attitude with within some of it, and that that stuff would 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 be would, would be would be in there somewhere. But I think in terms of genres, I'd be interested in what other genres you 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 thought. I mean, there's a bit of country there, of course. Well, at, at times as well, especially lyrically and um, sort of the political side of it, it reminds me a bit of Neil Young. Yeah, that's nice. I love Neil Young. Yeah. It was um I wanted to touch upon as well uh sending the suits isn't necessarily a concept album but i feel like throughout it has a particular um concept from flowing through it yeah it kind of sits on something doesn't it yeah do you think possibly then because it's around a particular idea that writing songs is a lot easier because it's around one particular topic or subject so, so, so some of the stuff direct, directly relates to that. A, a lovely example of that is um, "Safe at Home," and I, I actually only messaged my daughter about this, my oldest daughter, about this last last night, um, just because because the album came out. So I sent her a link to the song. Um, that song is all about um, me being here, her being about three or four miles away, but might as well have been three hundred because I couldn't visit her. Her being on my mind, me getting on with my life, thinking about everyone going through that same experience in a kind of a separated way, 
Um, so that song, and, and in the last 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 uh, verse, I say, um, I'd like to come around to your place, shake your hand and kiss your face. And I'm directly talking about my daughter. So so some of that song, you know, some of those songs, you know, came directly out of lockdown. Uh, Our New Norm, another one, of course, uh, talking about old people, uh, older people queuing up for their pension in the pouring rain two meters apart on a, on a wet and miserable day. You know, that kind of stuff comes along. Some of it, like Deep Trouble, um, is so miserable. <laughs> but, uh, and what do you think about that? It's so num- so miserable that the pathos of it suited the feel of the album. Send in the suits, what a ridiculous idea. Um, it's 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 a it's a fairly stupid instrumental, like two, two and a half minutes. When we recorded it uh with Jim, we all sat round uh together, played it together, banged down the acoustic guitar. Keo did some of the guitar stuff later on. He wanted us to play kazoo- kazoos on it, right? But it ended up being I thought what a great idea. Why don't we have send in the suits, this crazy little instrumental, and make it the title track of the album, put it on right towards the end, inconsequentially, and, and call it call it the the, the 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 name of the album. And then after that, I wrote another one, which was just an instrumental this way up. So put that one right right at the end. So some of the stuff came out of come out of that. Some of it was pre existing. Some of the songs were written absolutely years ago. Um, and what, however. It's not a concept album. There's nothing wrong with concept albums. But like I said earlier, the word, the academic word for it is paradigm. It sits on the paradigm, I think, of shared experience, of dealing with um, difficult times, of be, uh, trying, to, trying to help each other and recognizing that life is very difficult. And we went through one of the most difficult periods, in, 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 certainly in my lifetime and in most people's lifetime during lockdown. So some of it is kind of coincidentally within the spirit of the album. And like I said earlier, they were recorded at different locations in different ways. But it kind of, and it's nice that you're saying this, I think it sort of sits together quite well. And I think the track order, I think, sort of works as well. Yeah, do you think possibly then, I've noticed this with other artists as well, a lot of times you think it's easier to write songs about sad things rather than about yeah. happier things that are happening definitely yeah things which hurt you things which which cause you uh emotion things which make you angry um i find you know are often often come fairly easily to me i don't don't think i've ever written that many genuinely soppy romantic love songs um yeah i don't i don't think i have i mean there's even songs like for example on the album uh there's a song called um Oh blimey! It's 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 one of the more one of the more country ones. Um, don't change my dear. So don't change my dear. You you hear that? I don't know what you think, but you might think that's you know a love song it must have been yeah. somebody Stephen it, met. It sounds a lot more ballady to me that one compared to a yeah, lot of the rest of the album. It's ballady, but actually, it's written about no one. Um, you know, so even that, which is probably the closest to a a kind of ballad is actually not about anyone yeah um well on to even though it's not necessarily a concept album i think i was thinking of concept albums and throughout sending the suits there's a lot of use of different sounds and experimentation yeah and i thought do you think possibly then being having an overall idea then that sort of helps giving you the creative freedom to experiment with different sounds? Well, an interesting way to answer that one was, it is rather, last night I was listening to, I can't remember the name of the album, but there's an album being put together very recently, which is um, a compilation of various artists, a lot of them quite recent contemporary artists, doing versions of Nick Drake songs. I don't know whether you've heard much Nick yeah, Drake. Yeah, with like um, Fontaine's DC. Yeah, the version of the cello song. That so Font, and I, that is that is. I'm glad you mentioned that. Fontaine's DC's version of cello song is the opening track on this album, and it's completely different from the actual version of yeah. cello song as well. Now, I love Nick Drake. I love Same. Nick Drake's music. Uh, in fact, I went to bed last night listening to a podcast about 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 Nick Drake. So I love Nick Drake, and Fontaine's DC, their version of cello song, which is massively different. Yeah. As it happens, 
is my favorite cover version of any song ever. Really? Well, it, it is a great rendition, I think, of, of the track. But it's very much Fontaine's DC taking someone else's song and doing it in their style rather than go using Nick yeah. Drake's style. But going back to the question you asked me, that's the reason that I, I mentioned it, was because with a lot of the songs on on the, we missed, my wife and I listened to most of the most of the songs last night from that from that uh, Nick Drake um, kind of uh, cover album, if you like, and a lot of them were using new technology and kind of drum and bass techniques and um, nice uh, effects with vocals and keyboard sounds and all the rest of it. So it's kind of like a a postmodern take. And what I was wondering was, I wonder. I think he would have loved it, actually. But I wonder what Nick Drake, who died in 1974, by the way. We're still talking about him. Nearly 50 years ago. Well, I wonder what he would have made of that, of that, uh, that that album of all these different artists taking his songs in totally different directions, you know. Um, but yes, the use of sounds and technology, like today, I'm at my home studio here. In fact, it's not working. I did something stupid to it yesterday. But, but you, you know, you can easily create sounds... You know, you can download patches. You can you you can make things sound really, really beautiful and different. But it still always comes back to melody and, and um, songwriting and saying something in your music. Really, I don't want to touch too much on um, Nick Drake, but he's seen as the uh, Vincent Van Gogh of music, isn't he? Really, because during <laughs> his life, during his lifetime, he didn't get a lot of popularity. But since his passing, he sort of really gained like a cult following. Which are yeah, I mean he's one of he's one of the uh, one of the main members of the so called Twenty Seven Club, you know, who died at yeah. twenty seven. He would have been seventy five, I think, now or something like this. Seventy five, yeah. seventy six. Well, I, I think he was past. I think he just missed out on the Twenty Seven Club. I think he was like twenty six or something. Okay, and he, he might be right, but he was he was around about the same age. Wasn't he he was around around about the same age. He gets grouped in that. But one thing I do find interesting about him, intriguing, is that there's not really any video footage of him or any sort of interviews that you can listen to, which I. I think only adds, only adds to the legend of Nick Drake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, um, we 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 used to do one of his songs. Um, I don't think we'll be doing it again, but I, I, it's one of my it's one of my all time it's my all time favorite song. If somebody said, "What's your all time favorite song?" I'd say this song. If somebody said, "What's your all time favorite album?" I'd say this album. So it's Pink Moon uh, by Nick yeah. Drake, and um, what was beautiful about it last night and quite touching really was obviously the reverence with which these artists, some of whom, you know, they, they wouldn't even have been born when, when Nick Drake died, but the reverence with which they treated those songs. And I suppose if I say as a songwriter, what I like about his writing, um, I love the textures of the sentiment. I love the melodies. I love the sense of harmony. And I love that they're so um, kind of uh, quirky and, you know, from the from from his from his perspective, from his from his soul, um, and uh, you know, you mentioned you mentioned uh, another artist earlier. You know, the Buckleys. You know, people who yeah. you know sadly are no longer with us. Um, there's a lot of them. A lot of my favorite artists are no longer on the planet. You know, um, and of course, yeah, Nick Nick Drake's legacy is largely shaped by the fact that his his his, his success came after his death, and mostly was mostly triggered, as you, you you may already know this, it seems like you know a lot about him, but it was mostly triggered by uh, Pink Moon being used in a um, uh, commercial for for an automobile, you know, and that's what kind yeah. of brought him back into the, into, the, into the knowledge of people. It's interesting really that you brought that up because obviously Jeff Buckley, as you probably already know, is a musician that means a lot to me, but tragically he's, he's no longer with us. So it made me sort of think, you think music is probably the most or one of the most everlasting um, parts of media in the world. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that, yes, I mean, it's so important. Um, it's so um, seminal, really, to us as human beings. Uh, there are kind of two things which I think are really kind of seminal to us. One is um, the idea of storytelling passed down through generations. And equally, the, the the sharing of uh, music and songs and um, the feelings that they evoke, whether you listen to something you, you heard years ago or whether you're sitting around a tent, maybe late at night, you've got a, a fire going and you're down on the gower or whatever and somebody's sitting there playing a guitar and playing you an original song. There's something very, very special about music. Um 
And no matter how we AI-ify our lives, referring to our last album, AI as well, by the way, uh, then, you know, that, that is, it's a primal, it's a primal human characteristic and it's very important and uh, needs to be cherished and revered and supported. And people actually need to occasionally chip out some money and buy an album from an artist if they want to support them because how can they continue to do something forever for nothing? The answer is they can't. Um, just one final question then to, from me to sort of overarch the interview. How do you think the band has developed them from album to album? So when we did the first album, which was called Downstairs with Dan Sim, we had a different drummer. Uh, he was quite punky. He is a former punk. Um, good guy um, uh, and, and a great spirit about him. But then when 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 he left the band, um, we then brought in a new drummer who I played with back in the 80s. Um, he was one of the best drummers, stroke musicians that I've ever played with. Um, so he he as uh, Sean he came he came into the band. The first rehearsal he turned up and we we'd sent him some I'd sent him some songs to have a listen to. So we all turned up and knew the songs better than us at the first rehearsal. He was telling no no it goes like this you know, and he had it all written down and everything. So he's 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 kind of super organized. And I suppose that that's 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 influenced us that we need to be we need to be in our game. So sometimes we do a gig. And it'd be really direct with me, you know, this song didn't work because, 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 or we need to do this and we need, need to do that. So he's kind of professionalized us, I suppose. Um, I think what's happened through the songs as well over the albums, rather the three albums, Downstairs for Dancing, AI and Send in the Suits, is we have, I think, I, I can honestly say that I know of, probably one of the best guitarists in South Wales, uh, easily good, good enough to be a, a professional musician and has played with some quite significant musicians over the years. And he's got an unpredictability to how he plays, an idiosyncrasy to how, to, how to how he plays. Um, and he never plays the same solo twice, which is all great. However, I think on this album, we've slightly stepped away from long, lengthy solos a bit, and we've become maybe more song-based. I tend to write three-minute songs. It's a tradition in music, isn't it? Three minute pop songs. I tend to write two and a half, three minute songs. And I think what we what we've got a little bit better at is uh refining what we do as a band and looking at the cohesive whole rather than the individual parts in a better way. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Speak soon. Cheers. Well, thank you.